Renaissance people. If you are enjoying the Italian Renaissance podcast, I have good news. We're now active on Patreon. You can show your love for the show by becoming a patron and get access to additional resources, information, and artworks. Better yet, those who join the Renaissance Master or Renaissance Patron tier will get access to at least one additional podcast episode each month. My goal is to ensure that the main podcast remains a free, accessible source for everyone. Become a patron today through the link in the show notes to support the continued production of new episodes and help build and maintain this community. The Italian Renaissance Shop is now also active on Etsy, linked in the show notes. Sport our logo or choose from a growing selection of Italian art-inspired designs. Discounts are offered to select Patreon tiers as well. Your support has my immortal gratitude. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Italian Renaissance Podcast, where we discuss the culture and art of 15th and 16th century Italy. I'm your host, Lawrence Gianangeli. Andiamo avanti. Hello, Renaissance people, and welcome to the continuation of the history of Renaissance Venice. Please excuse me, because I'm a little under the weather, so my voice is a little scratchy, and I'm a little sniffly, but the show must go on. We have now established the political and geographical circumstances of Venice coming out of the Middle Ages and how those manifest in the 14 and 1500s, including the multitude of cultural influences and, in our last episode, we discussed the lasting legacy of St. Mark the Evangelist in both the visual culture and the formation of Venetian identity. While our analysis of San Marco brought us to a painting by Giovanni and Gentile Bellini, I want us to return to examining the Venetian Renaissance through a chronological development of cultural influences and style, and that begins with their father, Jacopo Bellini. If you recall, I used the example of his flagellation drawing to demonstrate how earlier Florentine design influenced the development of Venetian art. Now we are going to look deeper at Jacopo and his lasting impact on Renaissance art in Venice. Jacopo was both born in Venice around the year 1400 and died in Venice around 1470. We can loosely declare that Jacopo is the artist who formally brought principles of Renaissance art that was developing in Florence to Venice and eventually proliferated it in his own workshop. It's his own tutelage that came under the artist Gentile da Fabriano, one of the more prominent painters of central Italy. We have come across him before when we were talking about his magnificent adoration of the Magi in Florence, one of his masterworks of the international Gothic style. Let's keep in mind that Jacopo's first son, Gentile Bellini, is named after his own master, Gentile da Fabriano. So let's do our best not to mix up all of these Bellinis and Gentiles as we move forward. And additionally, Andrea Mantegna was married into the Bellini family as Jacopo's son-in-law. So a great deal of the early Renaissance in Venice is directly tied to Jacopo's immediate circle. Significantly around 1423, it has been suggested, though note without absolute certainty, that Jacopo and Gentile da Fabriano journeyed together to Florence. We can imagine the state of the city at the time. Filippo Brunelleschi's dome was just beginning its construction. Donatello and Ghiberti were dominating the sculpture scene, seeing the blending of the predominant Gothic style with classical influence. Giovanni di Bici de' Medici was among the wealthiest citizens in Florence and was grooming his son Cosimo, who would take de facto rule by the middle of the Quattrocento. Likewise, painters like Masaccio, who we have not discussed, were developing and maturing the naturalistic style that Giotto had introduced a generation prior and referencing form through Donatello's innovative approach on sculpture that he studied during his sojourn to Rome with Filippo Brunelleschi. 
all of these lines of experimentation, innovation, stylistic development, intersections of sculpture and painting, they're all converging in this period. And Jacopo Bellini is a 20-something-year-old artist, and he's just taking it all in. And that is whether or not he actually went to Florence with Gentile da Fabriano. The result of this exposure is Jacopo's interest in naturalism and innovation of his own style when he returns to Venice and subsequently pass this interest and development on to his sons and his workshop. The subject of Jacopo's style is typically treated through the example of his two drawing books, one now in Paris and the other is in London. Remember again, I have already used one of these drawings, the flagellation, in our introductory episode to parallel Albertian perspective with Jacopo's own design. The recession of space, the sharp linear qualities of architecture, there are explicit references to central Italian design development, which Jacopo elaborates in these scenes with the scale of naturalistic figures who also recess in the space, enabling a vividly realistic yet imaginative scenes. What is particularly curious about his drawings is how he is combining traditional religious scenes with exercises in pagan-themed, sculpturally-inspired drawings. Jacopo, like any other artist in the mid-Quattrocento, is balancing his curiosity around classical revival and the pagan elements of it, which his contemporary Christian culture blatantly condemned anything that resembled idolatry. So we often see the common combination of an idol or a sculpture of a pagan deity plus a column where the idol would be placed on top. However, these objects are often placed in relation to the living image of Christ. As such, he can display his interest in pagan forms by way of a pictorial demonstration. The living form of the god of his culture stands triumphant over the often collapsed pagan order. Yet we can argue that paganism enhances the pictorial beauty of the drawings based on the changing aesthetic taste of the period, right? People are starting to appreciate classical form again. Still, his approach to depicting the holy is unusual. It's decentralized. It's in direct neglect of established pictorial tradition of religious subjects of the 1400s, which tended towards formulaic or structured approaches to devotional art objects. One remarkable example is his drawing of the baptism of Christ. The essential point of the action, the actual baptism, is dwarfed by this towering landscape in a a river cuts through where the very small Christ is being baptized by John the Baptist and the cohort of angels, if you can make them out, because they're so small. Christ stands in an identifiable and traditional pose, the same iconic pose that Verrocchio will use in his last famous painting of the same subject in collaboration with his pupil Leonardo da Vinci. Yet the, the river bends, and it breaks the composition of the drawing, and upon its bank, aligned with Christ, is that collapsed column with the broken pieces of a pagan idol. Christ's baptism is marking the moment that Christianity is triumphing over antiquity, but Jacopo insists on giving the fallen idol a primary position in his composition. This subject is thoroughly explored in the book Venetian Painting Matters. The introductory essay is written by Professor Christian Kleinbub, um, a very kind man who I had the privilege to study under at The Ohio State University. In his essay, Jacopo Bellini and the Drawing of Idolatry, he perfectly summarizes how Jacopo reconciles Christian themes in his drawing books. Christian Kleinbub says... Yet, Jacopo, like other early Renaissance artists, was devoted to antiquity and his idols, not to mention his depictions of real and imaginary pagan monuments, 
could embody meaning beyond the religious kind. Just as they may point to their differences from Christian images, idols could represent the aesthetic power of ancient art promoting the self-worth of the artist while simultaneously embodying a sort of artistic challenge. Idols were, not for Jacopo, mere representatives of a defunct religious system or sinister bearer of temptations. Their aesthetic beauty seems to have mattered to him as much as anything else, and thus idols negotiated the grounds between two world views, revealing something of the complex nature of Jacopo's own artistic commitments. End quote. We can use the analysis of this imagery to look into the possible intentions of the artists of the period, what larger ideas they may have pondered, and even make informed statements of how they were thinking about their own cultural institutions in light of a changing world. Jacopo's drawing books had both an experimental and a practical use, and not until the next century were they considered works of art in their own right. Yet, during his life and after his death, they served as reference models for his pupils in his workshops, including his sons Gentile and Giovanni, and will influence their work greatly. We already bore witness to some of this, didn't we? Should we consider St. Mark preaching in Alexandria again, the painting by the Bellini that we discussed in the last episode, we can see a clear tendency to bury the primary religious devotional scene in a massive perspectival architecture, both elaborate and inventive, to the point where everything else going on in the work almost overshadows the religious narrative. All of this exists simultaneously with the Bellini executing rather traditional devotional paintings. These works are often, I don't want to say standard, but perhaps conventional. What that means is that there are instances of marked departures from typical choices of style, medium, and composition as the works of the Bellini workshop develop, both relating to the inventive influence of Jacopo and additional changes and influences happening in Venice as the Renaissance style began to evolve there. For many of the earliest paintings by the Bellini, the chances are they were made with tempura paint on wood panel, much like what you might find in central Italy. Tempura paint, or egg tempura, mixes egg yolk with ground pigments and a bit of water. The egg yolk enhances color brightness, but these paints dry very quickly, and that is important. In those early examples, such as Giovanni Bellini's Dead Christ, supported by two angels, from around 1460, we can already see Giovanni's attempt towards naturalistic anatomy, not quite there yet, and a very delicately rendered sky with sharp gradient of color. While egg tempura is a vibrant medium that did allow the artist to depict naturalistic forms and landscapes, it would fade in popularity to a medium that better enabled the Renaissance artist to nearly perfect naturalistic form, something that they were quite um, concerned with doing. By the late Quattrocento, oil paint had become the most workable and favored medium in Venice. The slow pace in which oil paints dry gave the artist more time to work their surfaces, enabling more time and detail to figures, expression, landscape, and a much smoother finish. Artists decided between painting either oil on wood panel, same with egg tempura, which was on, on wood panel, or later in Venice, oil on canvas. The influence of oil paint in Venice is a result of both their trade connections and the import of colors and materials, as well as the arrival of Netherlandish panels painted in oil paint. A technical analysis, that is a more scientific approach to our historical study that is far beyond me, revealed that Giovanni experimented in oil painting as early as 1473 and in his Coronation of the Virgin located today in uh, Pesaro, which very likely was the result of his viewing of these Netherlandish works. 
I'm not actually sure if it's Pizarro or Pizarro. Someone send me a message and tell me what that is, uh, how to pronounce the, the city. So shortly after, in 1475, the renowned Sicilian painter Antonello da Messina spent a year in Venice, and with him came his advanced understanding of how to work oil paints. Although there is evidence to support a number of his works were painted in Venice, his San Cassiano altarpiece, which only survives in fragments today, would influence the trajectory of altarpieces in Venice, starting with the work of Giovanni Bellini, son of Jacopo Bellini. We should consider the innovations of Giovanni Bellini in light of his training by his father, meaning the tendency towards naturalism inspired by antiquity, the multitude of influences on him from outside of Venice, be it Florence, the Netherlands, now Sicily, or even the existing Byzantium influences in the city of Venice. Giovanni reacted to all of these in his St. Job altarpiece, San Giobbe, the book Painting in Renaissance Venice by Peter Humphrey explains the importance of this work. Humphrey states that Bellini in turn had reached a stage in his career when he was ideally equipped to grasp Antonello's message. His answer to the San Cassiano altarpiece was the work that can claim to be the central masterpiece of Venetian painting in the later 15th century. Take that in, guys. The San Job altarpiece as the central masterpiece of later 15th century Venetian painting, according to Peter Humphrey. You're going to want to try to look at this image as we dive deeper. We are talking a large-scale oil painting on panel that was designed in situ, or painted to accompany the setting and architecture where it would be placed inside the church of San Giobbe around 1480, though it is now in the Academia in Venice. It's been removed from its site, which kind of detracts from um, the in situ aspect of the work. What is the complete use of oil paint permitting Giovanni here? Have a look immaculately smooth gradients, a heightened sense of texture and tonality. Look, there is flesh, there is stone, fabrics both regal and modest, hair, marble, the glimmering glass shimmer of golden mosaic. Incredible. And look how the space is rendered. There is a marked departure from earlier Quattrocento religious painting where figures often share the same plane. Instead, they are placed in a seemingly three-dimensional space. The virgin and child are pushed into the architecture, the two groups of saints closer to the space of the spectator. They stand in between you and the enthroned Saint Mary. The virgin is still elevated above. Her hand raised in blessing, her gaze is looking over you. It's not directly addressing you. The humanity that we see in these saints is stark. Their halos are mere slivers of paint. They are identified by their popular symbols, yet they are individualized, almost as if you might find them wandering the Venetian streets. Maybe not St. Sebastian, though. Look at him, plugged full of arrows. He Stands like a classical sculpture in contraposto. His anatomy is perfected, idealized, beautiful. Right? I guess in the objective concept of beauty in the Renaissance. I think we are seeing a translation of those sculptural qualities found in Jacopo's drawing here in Giovanni's painting. And what is going on in the background? We have seen those gold mosaics before, haven't we? Certainly they evoke the interior of the Basilica of San Marco. Specifically, it is a series of those five Byzantine seraphim, or those sort of abstracted angel forms from Christian theology. See how a devotional altarpiece to the Virgin Mary, among the most esteemed saints in Venice, is referencing the Venetian legacy as it pertains to St. Mark? all while being presented through a complex history of design influence, be it from 
Florence, the Netherlands, or Sicily. Not to mention that this work likewise is influenced by Giovanni's Paduan brother-in-law, Andrea Mantegna's San Zeno altarpiece from around 1460, which unfortunately goes beyond the scope of what we can cover today. This painting is what is known as a Sacra Conversazione, a holy conversation, including the Virgin and Child with groups of saints. That's what they typically are, and it was among the most uh, monumental Sacre Conversazioni of its time, recalling the earlier, larger religious scenes by the Bellini, where the figures are dwarfed by their surroundings. Yet, that difference in scale is harmonized in this painting. There is no mistake that this is a sacred image, but one that both directly quotes Venetian architectural space and its religious implications, as well as embeds the work in a physical architectural setting that is not San Marco. Pretty cool, right? I do not want to make general claims about any individuals as being responsible for any given cultural movement. And the early works and influence of Jacopo Bellini are just one single piece, however, very important, a very important piece, of the many moving parts that produced major cultural changes in the Quattrocento. I hope that I made his role clear and the subsequent results of how Jacopo's innovations blended with a variety of other factors to produce a cultural shift in painting in Venice in the Quattrocento, particularly through his sons and followers who would take up after his work. This is by no means the end of the story, but rather just the beginning of the development of a Venetian Renaissance style. Try to keep in mind that we have now explored painting development in the 1400s, a style which will take new forms in the 1500s, be it in the later works of the Bellini, to Titian, Veronese, and Tintoretto, who we've talked about, among many other artists in Venice. I also want to include a side note that there is ongoing scholarship about the Bellini and how we understand their impact and influence and in, in works uh, is changing. So what I have provided you is the, I suppose, most canonical or the most um, accepted version of how we understand the Bellini, their painting, their drawings, their innovation in the early Venetian Renaissance, but that is subject to debate and to future change. We talked about a lot of paintings today. As always, I will be updating the Instagram with all of the images mentioned, which also post to the podcast Facebook. So go follow us on your preferred social media. Be sure to tell your art and art history friends about the show. Help me build this community. I want to say thank you to those who have directly supported the show and if you want to support this project, you can do so directly through the link in the show notes. Reviews are also essential in getting this show exposure. I want to thank everyone who has left me a review, and I want to encourage all of you to either leave a star rating or a written review to your leisure. It really helps me out a lot, and if you're enjoying the show, I would greatly appreciate that. And lastly, keep reaching out and talking to me. I love chatting with you guys. I've been having a great time responding to messages and emails and tags and posts and all of this sort of thing. So keep the engagement up. I am always happy to talk and give you my travel recommendations, my gallery recommendations, book recommendations, anything you're looking for. Just send me an email. Send me a message on Facebook. Send me a message on Instagram. I love talking to you guys. Thank you all for tuning in. Moving forward, we are going to continue with Renaissance Venice, so stay tuned and arrivederci.